Our next speaker is going uh, is Sara. Sara is going Sara Stetnitz. She is a postdoctoral fellow in the Zopping Lee Lab at the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics in Germany. Her talk is titled Zebrafish Exhibit Visual Attentional Pop-Out Effects in Their Behavior. Stage is yours, Sara. Thank you for the kind introduction. So uh, I'm in a lab that primarily is focused, historically has been focused on questions of visual attention. I'm also co-advised by Jennifer Lee and Jim Robson, who do a lot of really fantastic uh, microscopy and behavior experiments, specifically in zebrafish. And I hope that I can uh, sell you on the end of this talk at, for the utility of studying this behavior that's common essentially to all vertebrate species uh, in an animal that is the size of an eyelash. So what is the problem of, of attentional selection? And animals have a problem with their sensory environment, right? This is exemplified by vision, especially, where there's much more information in a visual scene than could ever be processed by the brain. So if you're not going to spend 30 minutes processing every single scene that you look at, which of course is not advantageous to your survival, you need to have strategies for directing your attention only to parts of the visual scene that are important. So one of the hallmarks of this kind of bottom up, so very rapid attentional selection is called the pop-out effect. If I show you 10 dots and one of them is a unique color, or I show you 10 bars, and one of them is a unique orientation, they immediately draw your attention before you even have conscious awareness of it. So what does that actually look like as a behavioral readout? We call it orienting. So it takes many different forms. In humans, you might have a gaze shift. For example, when I switched to that slide with the single red dot, you probably looked at the dot before I even began speaking about anything. Uh, other animals might move their body parts, like a cat could rotate its ear towards something uh, that it heard in the environment. But in our model system, the zebrafish larva, they actually will do an orienting turn and move their entire body. Uh, but regardless of, of the mechanism for directing the sensory organ, eyes or ears or body towards um, this relevant stimulus in the environment, um, it's essentially the, the same type of behavioral readout. It, it shows you that an animal is selecting and directing its attention towards something in the environment. So why are we using the zebrafish specifically? Like this is certainly an established model organism in genetics, um, but it's also a really great model for neuroscience uh, and visual neuroscience in particular. They have many behaviors that are entirely dependent on vision that occur very early in development have evolutionarily conserved brain regions that are devoted to visual processing. So the optic tectum is uh, functionally equivalent to the superior colliculus in mammals. Um, and of course, my favorite part about them is that they're really amenable to this fabulous live imaging of neural activity. So we can do on the single cell scale whole brain recordings in a freely behaving animal, which is simply not possible in other vertebrate systems. So the experimental setup um, at this stage is behavioral, right? We wanna study the underlying computations that permit this behavior to happen. We need to demonstrate that it actually occurs in our animal the size of an eyelash. So we have our fish in an arena, um, and we're recording from below, doing live tracking of the body and the head position. And we're using that to, in real time, generate a stimulus and send it to a projector. We then project stimuli above the animal's head in different positions, colors, combinations relative uh, to the body axis and the position of the eyes. So to give you an example, for these experiments, we're using fictive prey. So, the zebrafish larva will hunt these little single-celled organisms, paramecia, and we're giving them something that mimics that. And we can place these fictive prey at different positions along uh, the midline of the fish. And by measuring their orienting turns of their 
body after stimulus onset, we can get a direct readout of what they're paying attention to in their digital environment. So the first test was to make sure that we really could get these animals to chase light. So we ran these experiments using just single white dots placed at eight possible locations in the visual field. So these are placed on the left side and these dots are placed on the right side. And if you look at the change in heading, so the orienting body turns one second, within one second after stimulus onset, when you present a stimulus to the left, we can get them to turn to the left. When you present it to the right, you can bias them to turn towards the right. So they are paying attention to uh, these artificial prey, even though they can't interact with them physically. And this is occurring at, at quite a low latency, it's something like 200 milliseconds, which is more or less what we would expect with this kind of very rapid attention selection. And we can pull out all kinds of nice extra pieces of data from this, of course. We want to know what the optimal position is to evoke an orienting response. And it turns out that it's about 45 degrees from the midline. Uh, this is nice because it agrees with naturalistic uh, behavioral analyses of prey capture that other groups have done. So sanity check is always a good deal. But we also ran these same experiments using different colors. So this is going to be necessary for the subsequent uh, visual attention experiments. We need to know, do they respond to red, green, and blue? The answer is yes, regardless of whether you present it on the left side or the right side, both red, green, and blue dots can evoke the same type of orienting response. So why is the color important, right? I like to use the color pop-out example because it's, it's the most immediately obvious, I think, to people and likely to fish. Fish have excellent color vision. They see red, green, blue, and ultraviolet. So instead of just showing one dot now, we're showing eight. So I've provided a stimulus that is seven distractors of a uniform background color and a single pop-out singleton. So that's one dot on either the right or the left side that's unique from all the other dots around it, although there's the same number uh, on either side. And what we're very excited about is that we were able to bias motion towards the side that the unique stimulus is placed on. And that's regardless of whether it's a red singleton with green distractors or a green singleton with red distractors. And so the next step for us, now that we've demonstrated that this tiny little brain is making this kind of computation, is to take this onto the microscope, where we can actually look at the activity of single neurons and how they're interacting with each other to directly test some of the computational hypotheses of how the pop-out effect is implemented both in humans and in fish. So with that, I'd, I'd love to take questions either about uh, the system or the experiments. Thank you, Sarah. This is so lovely. I, I, I think it must be really nice to work with fishes. They're, they are unbelievably cute. We have a couple of questions for you. Elena Jacobs, El, 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 from Elena, first question is from Elena Jacobs. Elena is saying really cool work. And uh, I believe the fish are freely moving. How do you control where in their visual field in this uh, the stimuli occur? or do you determine this post-talk? So we are doing live tracking. This is a, definitely one of the biggest challenges of, of implementing this kind of system. Uh, we really want to make sure that what we're showing the fish uh, reflects what the fish is actually seeing, right? Like, um, so it requires this on-the-fly tracking. At, at this stage, we're, we're doing it at 60 frames per second. And we basically only need an instantaneous snapshot. Uh, so we know where the fish is when the stimulus comes on, stimulus comes on, and then it stays in the same position. So it doesn't actually update its position with the fish, which helps in case of tracking errors and things like that. But it certainly um, has been a lot of technical innovation and calibration to make sure that this is really robust um, and automated. Okay, thank you very much. For the other questions, unfortunately, I, I don't see the name clearly for the 
the person who is asking the question. It's like mmazer.17 at ucl.ac.uk. He says, this is very, very cool. In explicit report paradigms in humans, a pop-out effect is also observed for color absence and nothing that no target is present. Is this something that has been or can be tested on larva? Yeah, so um, there's no reason we can't do all of the same experiments we do in people and in fish with this setup, which is one of the, the best parts about it. I think our one limitation is the number of distractors that we can present because there's only so far away that we can, um, they can see, right? Uh, I think that's an awesome idea. That, I mean, that would be a, a great experiment to implement. I can tell you uh, the other piece of data I have from the, the pop-out experiments that isn't shown in this talk is um, uniform. So eight dots on all sides and there's no singleton. And that you get stochastic turning. So it would be fabulous to see that kind of symmetry breaking uh, just by the, by the absence. That's a great suggestion. And for the another questions, thank you. In uh, for the qu previous questions, the name was Maiton Mazer. Thank you for cl cl clarifying your name, Maiton. And for the next question uh, from Inbal Shaner, he says, very cool. Are the eight dots are constantly presented? Is the singleton surprising the pops out? So the eight dots are constantly presented. And you bring up actually an interesting point because motion pop out is something that has been studied in different species of fish. There's a um, species of fish called the archer fish that actually sprays water at its prey. And they've been able to train these animals to um, target different pop outs. So uh, this is not a system that's amenable to, to live imaging, of course, which is why we're trying to do it in, in zebrafish. So for these experiments, the color pop out, they all appear simultaneously, including the singleton. The reason for that is if you change your stimulus, that could then become a motion pop out. We're really interested in, in doing those experiments. And, and I think, you know, it'd be cool to do orientation. Um, it's a little challenging because of the projector system, you're projecting from above. Uh, but I think it's, it's quite likely that the same kind of effects we see with this color paradigm, we would see with motion, like a change uh, in the stimulus. That, that sounds so cool. Thank you. And for the last questions from Ameya Menon, say so cool. How could you please go over once again what kind of bias you observed when presenting multiple colors? Yeah, so in the case of, of like the, the human pop out effect, right? If I just showed you these eight dots and one of them is unique, your attention is going to go towards that unique dot. Because we're using these orienting turns of the fish as our readout, we would expect if the pop-out effect is working in our system, that if we present something that's unique on the right side, the animal would make an orienting turn towards the right side. And that, that is what we see. Um, and I think very critically, uh, one of the most important things about these data is that both combinations work. So there's, I've gotten a lot of questions about whether or not there's innate color preferences. Like if they just like red dots more, then they're always going to turn to the red dot, right? And perceptually, the green uh, channel on our, our projector is actually probably quite a lot brighter. So maybe it's just the sheer number of, of photons that the fish is, is getting on its retina, right? But the fact that in both cases, whether you have red singleton and then seven green distractors or a green singleton, seven red distractors, we can bias them to turn only towards where the unique stimulus is. I hope that clarifies. Thank you very much. And if you have more questions for Sarah, Jesse, or Amin, please reach